Talib from the United States of America and he will talk about nano diamonds in the different applications. Uh, good morning everybody, my name is Vadim Machalet. I'm a uh, uh, faculty in uh, chemistry at Missouri University of Science and Technology. I'm also a graduate in uh, science and engineering department. Uh, today uh, you will see diamonds in the second stage of our computer to explain the information. I changed the talk to this because I gave a very detailed lecture yesterday at the school uh, for a young scientist which uh, I believe was very nice event so thank you again for the organizers. So for today I decided to make more products and talk about vaccines for energy regeneration and optical applications. Uh, let me start with technology people who actually have done this for experimentally. Two of my postdocs, I'm not sure I need the microphone. Uh, can you hear me in the back? You cannot? Okay. No problem. So, uh, I want to acknowledge help from my uh, two postdoctoral researchers who had done majority of this work here, which I'm going to present, and also my collaborators from Drexel University and from Clemson University. Uh, okay. So next slide, uh, I want to quickly introduce you this new family of materials, Maxines, because uh, maybe I'm not sure how many people here have heard about Maxines before, but it's quickly growing uh, area in 2D materials. And if you look at this area of 2D materials a few years ago, before 2011, you would see that basically the entire area was heavily dominated by graphene, just one material. Uh, over a few uh, years, uh, other uh, two-dimensional materials have been discovered, transition metal uh, decalcogenides, uh, clays were with us for thousands of years, uh, <coughs> hexagonal boron nitride, uh, and so on. And in 2011, a new large family of transition metal carbides and nitrides which we call Maxines, was discovered at that time at Drexel University, where I worked in the group of Professor Gagotz. So Maxines are basically uh, 2D forms of traditional uh, transition metal carbides, such as titanium carbide, vanadium carbide, niobium carbide, and so on. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? I'm not sure why it doesn't work properly. So to understand why we are so excited about Maxines, <coughs> Uh, we first of all need to look at the precursors of Maxines, which are max phases. Max phases are known for a very long time, and there are many of max phases, more than 70 different max phases. So what the name max phase means? Uh, it means... Sorry? Far. Perfect. This is what I want. <coughs> so, what the name max... Sorry. What the name max phase means? M stands for an early transition uh, element. Uh, any of these red elements here in the periodic table. A is A group element. Any of these blue elements here. And X stands for carbon and nitrogen. So max phases are ternary uh, crystalline compounds, bulk materials. And if you look closer at their structure, they are formed by MX blocks. You will see one of these blocks here. So gray represents <coughs> uh, uh, gray represents uh, M and uh, red represents X, right? Oh, the opposite. And, uh, red represents M and gray represents X. So this forms an X block, essentially a uh, carbide, for example, of titanium. And between these blocks, you see blue layers of blue elements. So these are eight elements: aluminum, gallium, and so on. And if you look further, you will see that different max phases have different thickness of this MX box. Okay? So, this is what gives variety to different max phases. First, you can change the elemental composition. Second, you can also change the thickness of the MX box between A layers. And as I said, today more than 70 different max phases are known, and we use max phases as precursor materials to produce max. How we do it? 
semantically uh, shows how they produce maxes. So it basically take, take max, uh, max phases. In this case, it's titanium uh, aluminum, titanium three aluminum C2, and we invert it in solution of aqueous hydrofluoric acid. It creates a hydrofluoric acid, as shown in this uh, picture here. Produces hydrogen, you'll see a lot of bubbles, or you've seen already a lot of bubbles. And what happens in this process, we selectively remove aluminum, in which case this is the A element. We selectively remove aluminum, dissolve it in the HF, and what we are left with, shown again in this schematic, are blocks of MX. So this is how we produce MX blocks, separate MX blocks. They are to be materials. And we call them maxine. Why? Because we start from max phases, we remove A element, and we are left with MX. And to uh, emphasize similarity of maxine to other 2D materials, uh, first of all, graphene, we added the ending E. So hence uh, how the name came. Uh, and you can see that maxine is now produced in the form of uh, colloidal solutions. Uh, it's not something exotic again. We can produce liters of this. Uh, and the end really shows you that they are 2D materials because they are almost trans transparent. For those people who work with graphene and other materials, they uh, can tell uh, it's an indication of uh, very good material. So, I did something wrong. Uh, surprisingly, how fast this temperature reacts when you push the wrong button? When you push the right button, it takes a while. Yeah, for example, uh, the next. Okay, so again, uh, I just wanted to show you that we can now produce different vaccines depending on which next phase we start with. They differ in elemental composition. We can produce titanium 3C2 vaccine, titanium 2C2, or diurgon 2C2, and they differ in the thickness of MX blocks. For example, we can produce titanium 3C2, titanium 2C, or titanium uh, 4C3 which will have three atomic layer, uh, layer, atomic layer sheets or uh, five atomic layer sheets or seven atomic layer sheets. So as you can imagine now, the variety of potential vaccines is huge. So this is uh, probably the most important discovery in the area of 2D materials over the past years because it brings more than 70 different new two-dimensional materials uh, what else you can do with vaccines? You can form colloidal solutions, then you can filter the colloidal solutions again. It's not very well displayed in the screen, but basically my idea here was to show you filtration apparatus. Simple filtration apparatus with a funnel. You can uh, filter the colloidal solution and produce crystalline vaccine embrace. This is one example of this embrace. Depending on how many repetition filtering uh, repetitions you have, you can choose the thickness of 200 micrometers and it's really crystalline. Well, you can fold it, you can bend it, yeah, it doesn't uh, crush. Okay, next slide. Uh, the interest to Maxines is growing dramatically over the past years, so although they were discovered uh, only six years ago, uh, already many applications for Maxines have been explored. So, this is a list of already explored applications for Maxines, and you will see in this list that Maxines have been used for energy storage, capacitors different batteries, lithium ion, beyond lithium, sodium, magnesium, so on, uh, electrocatalysis, catalysis, multifunctional composites, uh, conducting coatings, desalination, mm -hmm. purification of water, with acidal films, plasmonics, lubricants, uh, thermoelectrics, basically a lot of applications. Why vaccines are so interesting uh, to uh, researchers is because it's a huge family of materials, and you can find the material for pretty much any application you can imagine. So in any application uh, where you can use or think about using two-dimensional material, you can find the vaccine which will perform in that application probably better than anything else. Okay, next slide. Uh, so what uh, we are doing in my group, we are trying to achieve, first of all, fundamental understanding of novel materials, which includes synthesis of novel materials, their characterization, computational modeling, and then use this knowledge of fundamental properties to develop applications for them. And I want to illustrate you how we do it uh, using an example of uh, colloidal distortions of vaccines. 
in solvents beyond water. First, vaccines were produced in water, and still water is the most commonly used solvent for vaccines, but there are many applications, for example, polymer composites, where you cannot use water, or can only use water in very uh, limited number of cases, because polymer processing is usually done in organic solvents. We worked on signing the structures of vaccines in organic solvents, and our goal was to, first of all, understand which properties of organic solvents govern the distortion stability, and second, to select the best solvents, uh, organic solvents, which should provide the best distortion stability properties. This is the range of solvents in form, and in this case, we work again this uh, PTA in PC2, this is considered carbonated, and then distorted in uh, organic solvent. Can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, now the science. Uh, oh, so how we characterize different solvents? Uh, it's classical physical chemistry. Solvents are characterized by so-called solubility parameters. Uh, there are many of them, so we use in this one two of them. One is Hildebrand solubility parameter, which is expressed by this equation here, and another is Hansen solubility parameter. The advantage of using Hansen solubility parameter is that it uh, allows you to separate different contributions into uh, solution stability or uh, <coughs> properties of this solvent. And those contributions are uh, destruction contribution, polar contribution, and hydrogen volume. And by classifying solvents based on constant parameters, you will see that basically solvents which provide higher, highest destruction stability should be determined simply by studying precipitation of vaccines in these solvents. Those solvents have higher values of destruction parameters, their label the stars here. Higher values of distortion parameters and also polar parameters. Whereas hydrogen body is not that essential, but water is an exception. Well, water is an exception pretty much uh, everywhere. It has so high hydrogen uh, uh, contribution, hydrogen bonding contribution, that it overweights the ever everything And water works on the same Okay? Now, we know which parameters are important for maximum stability and we can find the best solvent. The trick here is that we can use now, we can mix solvents okay, to achieve uh, better solubility. We know that we need to provide high uh, distortion and high polar part of, uh, contributions, so we can mix solvents such that they, the mix has the highest uh, distortion and polar contributions. That allowed us to prepare inks, so we can now disperse vaccines organic solvents prepare inks and then use these inks to fabricate thin films. The simplest technique to fabricate thin films, can you move to the next slide please, is spray tool. And this is what we have done in collaboration, uh, in collaboration with Drexel and Clemson University in the US. We basically prepare spin coated thin film of vaccine on glass or any other substance that's made. You can do the polymers, but we start with glass. So here's the procedure, we start with glass, the spray coat of this film, then they apply a uh, top electrode, so we're basically trying to fabricate the device. What is this device that we're doing? The top electrode is uh, IPO uh, uh, on uh, PET, this is polymer uh, film. Now, why we make this device? We want to use it to generate energy based on vaccine. In this case, the energy is generated by contact characterization. So what we do, we have these two fields, top is uh, PET with ITO, and bottom is glass with vaccine. And what we do, we basically bring them in contact, bring them in contact, and then separate them. And we repeat it many times, okay? This is why we have the same device, uh, which works like this. It just pushes uh, down and then breaks on. So what happens in this process during characterization, we produce energy. So we have uh, voltage produced during the synchronization, and you see that it goes up and down and corresponds to the frequency, the frequency of this uh, device. The open circuit voltage can reach up to, five, uh, up to 600 volts. Okay? Now we demonstrated to the next slide. We demonstrated that we can charge uh, capacitors using this uh, device. We can uh, light. Uh, like diets using this device, so we're basically harvesting energy. Okay? This is the whole idea. 
Then you can replace the flexible device. Working on sim uh, similar principle, but of course now instead of glass aircraft, you have to use flexible aircraft or the door. Then you can attach this device to your skin, you can walk with it, you can uh, move your uh, hand with, uh, with the device attached, and as a result, you will produce and harvest energy of motion, which is now a very hot topic. Because everybody wants to have their cell phones, their portable electronics charged all the time. So this is the most obvious solution. You incorporate this device in your clothes and then you walk and your device is always charged. You don't care about electrical uh, plugs and so on. Okay? So we can do it with Maxine. This is called uh, TEN, so, uh, uh, which is abbreviation for Driver Electric uh, Produce uh, regulated with Maxims. Now we can do more. Those fields which I mentioned uh, before were produced by steam coating and they are relatively thick. They are around micron thickness, maybe half micron. Okay? We can make much thinner filters actually by using a slightly different technique which uh, I call uh, interfacial film uh, self assembly. So the idea here is that. Yeah, we have aqueous solution of Maxine here, and we put on top of this aqueous solution an emissible organic liquid. We form the interface between two liquids, and Maxine self-assembles from aqueous colloidal solution, moves to the interface and self-assembles at the interface as a very thin field. Depending on the concentration of Maxine, we can change the thickness of the field. So it's a very simple technique. You can use it pretty much in any way and produce very thin fields. So this is basically a uh, schematic how we do it. So we put the substrate in the space for the film in the interface, then the right substrate it goes through the interface and picks up the film. So we have now one slide here with this interfacial film. And this is how it looks. You can see this is uh, pure glass, this is uh, glass with a thin film. You cannot see much, first of all, because this film is thin, uh, also because the projector doesn't show the color, it's not very good. But the limit there is a film. These films, we very simple on resonance here, uh, around uh, what, seven to eight hundred, something like that. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what we can do with these films? We develop them for optical applications. The films are very thin, and to convince you that they have good quality and are very thin, I show you here the same photographs of the film. So this is a large area, three hundred micrometers scale by. You can see that the whole area is uniformly uh, coated as my see. There are a few cracks here, which they show this arrows, and you can see silicon wafer in the background. Those are formed during the process of transferring of the field from the interface to the substrate. If you look closer though, you will see that the field is formed really from individual Maxine plates. There are plates here, which are not very clear, there is one here. And they are semi-transparent, so they are very thin mixing plates. The thickness of this film is determined by AFM, uh, shows us that they are uh, 30, 40 nanometers thick, which means two, three layers of maxine. So it's a very, very thin film. Now, uh, why we are interested in these films? As I said, we want them for optical applications. And in particular, we are interested in non-linear optical properties of this film. How to measure nonlinear optical properties? We use a technique called Z scan, so called Z scan, which is basically uh, you have this device, and this device which allows you to focus laser light in certain, in certain plane, and then you have your sample here, and you can move your sample so that it comes in and out of focus. When it comes in, in the focus, you have more laser intensity hitting the sample. When it comes out of focus, you have less intensity. And then you measure transmitters or absorbers of light. What uh, happens then, you can see that depending on, uh, depending on where your uh, film is, the transmittance and the absorbance change, which 
tells you that your material has different absorbance, light absorbance properties depending on the intensity of the light. Okay? Similar devices were fabricated before uh, using other antimaterials, mainly graphene. And you can see how graphene device or composite compression device from this graph here. Uh, later energy is increased in this direction, and you will see that that material, which is the difference in uh, transparency uh, depending on the uh, intensity of laser, uh, increases also in laser phase. But you see that the thin line stops here at around 20 uh, microns. Why it stops there? Because the thin starts to decompose in this uh, laser energy. It was so much energy that the thin starts to decompose. But see, can easily survive this range of energies and still absorbs light selectively, <coughs> which means maxine, first of all, is more stable than graphene for this application. Second, you can see from the slope of this line from maxine, the slope is higher, which means it's more sensitive than graphene. So it clearly outperforms graphene for this. Well, all this is nice, but who cares? Uh, who cares? So, uh, you know, uh, if you talk to a physicist, the physicist will tell immediately something. Oh, we can use this device for gear switching for lasers. What's that? It sounds like a rocket science, I think. Okay. But let me give you a simple example. <coughs> From time to time, we all read reports in the press about pilots, uh, airplane pilots being blinded by laser light when somebody uh, you know, this shooting laser uh, pointer in the sky and blinds the pilot. It becomes a serious uh, problem for commercial airlines because during landing or <coughs> uh, in general during flight, if the pilot is blinded, basically you put under risk, under risk uh, everybody on the floor. So it's a huge problem. An obvious solution would be, of course, to paint the windows in the pilot came in this uh, black paint, but then it doesn't help because it you can see, right? So what you need is a kind of paint, paint which will transmit visible light of low intensity, which is daylight, but will block the same visible light when the intensity goes up, which is laser. And this is exactly where these fields will find their application. There are many others, but I just want to give you a okay? So let me conclude with this. Uh, we introduced a new family of they potentially don't find a lot of applications. The interest is growing dramatically. Uh, uh, we work on fundamental understanding of policies, and we consider it as key for developing applications. Uh, and I think I demonstrated here that within the knowledge of, of colloidal solutions, the ability uh, of maxines and different solvents, we develop means uh, and techniques to produce thin fields which will find applications in tribal electric nanogenerators as well as nonlinear optical devices, for example, new switches to low laser uh, My last slide is, uh, I think, uh, yeah, this is only to thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, thanks for your talk. So please move on to ask questions. I would suggest if you have questions during the talk, you can come to the microphone that we can plan everything faster. But if, if nobody has questions at the moment, I can ask one probably. Uh, are there any semiconductors among your uh, structures? Yeah, this is again a beauty of vaccines. Uh, most of them are conductors, but by changing surface chemistry, and that was demonstrated uh, using uh, modeling. If you introduce certain surface terminations, for example, oxygen, you will change the band gap and convert them into silicon. So it's possible to make them silicon. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Please. Do you have a question to my question? In which uh, case? In the case of the story. No. Well, uh, we have some uh, hypotheses to explain it. First of all, um, it, graphene cannot survive very high energies. Why? Because it's just a single atomic layer, layer material. Uh, Maxine is at least three atomic layers. 
has very high thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, and so on. We believe this is the reason why it survives fire laser. Now, why it's more sensitive than uh, graphene? We also hypothesize that uh, it is because vaccine has a higher lifetime of uh, charge carriers, and it depends also on how thick the layer is. And there are calculations which uh, we do now to confirm or disprove it because it's only a hypothesis. Okay. So, that's the question. demonstrates superconductivity and in general what about its conductivity? Well, if we are talking about conductivity in general at room temperatures, uh, mostly all vaccines are very good conductors. They have conductivity more or less than, than graphene, sometimes even higher. Superconductivity have been, has been studied, uh, I know at least one paper in which one vaccine has been studied, but I think they did not find superconductivity up to <coughs> temperatures which are too low to be heated. So it converts into superconductor at very low temperatures, but there's one interesting Okay, thanks a lot. I guess we have to move further. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Chalet.